Necrosis. Today's video is going to be a little bit different than what a lot of you are used to. I'm going to be talking about my vaping stuff with the OBS engine being the star of the show. I'll go in and show you stuff later. I also have the newer Gen 3 and I've been using that. I haven't even opened the other one yet. I decided I was going to record the video when I do so that I can praise it from the highest of ceilings and stuffs. So this is what my new current setup looks like. I simply upgraded from my 200S to the Gen 3. And it's more or less about the same. Uh, the, the 510 pin's better, the screen size, whatever. It's bigger. But otherwise, it seems to be fine. The 510 pin is a lot nicer. And thing is smaller and it looks a little bit different. Batteries go in the bottom instead of through the sides, so it actually protects the wraps. So I'm 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 happy with that. I've been using this setup before the 200s with the OBS engine for about 10 or 11 months now, and I, I still have not been able to find tank-wise anything I can consider better by my standards and needs. So I got another one. I figured I need a backup, and I'd like to keep a backup of the device as well. So that's why I got a Gen 3 since it had come out. The video is going to be mostly a close-up of how I specifically coil this thing. How I build and put it on here. And even more importantly, how I wick it. I'm using stainless steel 316L using wire from Temco and my trusty old big ass box bought like four or five years ago from Sally's of just Graham Silly Cotton Rayon. 100% Rayon. I've been using it long before anybody has even tried to resell rebranding re of cottons and all that mess. I'm still surprised that didn't like rayon didn't become the new standard because it works so well, but it's a little bit different than working with cotton, which may be the reason everybody's so used to cotton that they try rayon and they don't do it correctly, they don't get the correct performance, and they go back to the old ways, and so everybody's still kind of in that, but. Anything you can do with cotton, you can do with rayon, and at least in my opinion, you can do it better. So, that's all I use. It's all I've been using. I've been using it for years, and I don't see myself changing to anything else anytime soon. One of the conundrums I have is, while I stream, I'm vaping and things, and people ask me, for recommendations. People that maybe have not even vaped the smoke or they have one device or another, but they ask me for a recommendation. Like, what do you recommend I get? Well, here's a, it, it's a, it's a difficult question for me to answer for multiple reasons. One, I am a very extreme personality type, meaning if I find this, and I like it. This is all I want. I don't want to touch anything else. I don't want to spend any more money on anything else because I don't like variety. If this is what I consider perfect or the best available, this is all I want to use. So I don't get experience with a variety of products, and I'm not in a position to be buying a lot of stuff anyways. It, 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 my days of spending lots of money on this hobby have kind of subsided. The technology is at a point where all my conditions have been met uh, without compromise, and that's exactly this device right here. But what works for me will not work for anyone else necessarily, and that's where the real problem in any kind of recommendations is because this is not something I can recommend for a beginner. 
if, if, if a normal person tried this, they would be coughing like nuts. It, it, you, you have to get to that point. And there's no beginner device I can recommend because I don't know. I just don't know. I went from like zero to 160 the very first day I started vaping. And the main issue I've had since then only came down to leaking. So I can only recommend something to someone that has the same needs that I do. And that is a high-performance device, rebuildable, easy to wick, and leak-proof. Those are kind of like the main variables in my case. So, instead of being able to recommend something to someone, being like, yeah, I would recommend this. You, well, I can recommend it, but you're not going to know what the hell you're doing if you're not already sufficiently experienced. And if you were, then chances are you wouldn't need to be asking me in the first place. So instead, what I wanted to do was make a video showing exactly what I do with this device and a little bit of how I do my mod setup, because that's a little bit of interest, some interest to some people. And kind of in a single video, encompass everything. So when someone asks me, I can say, well, check this video out right here that you're watching right now. And if what you saw from start to finish looked good to you, that's what I recommend because I can't recommend anything else. Nothing else has come close to this, this atomizer specifically. Let me get down and show you guys exactly, well, I'll do an unboxing type of thing. We will go from start to finish. So, I think I've got the camera situated and adjusted so the lighting actually makes things visible here. There isn't a whole lot to say about the box. It's just, well, your standard box, scratch and sniff, and... <laughs> nope, it smells like China. So it's not even a good scratch and sniff smell. We got something you shouldn't eat here. Um, at least I wouldn't recommend eating it. You should probably, uh, you know, throw it out. Or give it to your kids. Inside we have the actual atomizer itself. That looks like anything else. Some glass and this whole thing comes out. This wrench is important. Don't lose this. There's a manual that we don't really need since I've already been using this thing for almost a year. I guess if you don't know how to use it, you can use that, or you can use the internet. Now, this is what I wanted to see. What goodies does it come with? Because spare parts are always good. Let's see, inside we've got slight cotton. I'll be sure not to use that. That's garbage as far as I'm concerned. And our baggie of... Wait a minute. Something's not right here. Um, I don't see anything else. There's only one coil in here and two screws? What the fuck? It's... Oh! Engine Nano. That's... That's that's bullshit. Did they send me the wrong device? Hold on. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the actual engine, so why the hell did they send me... Hmm. Let's see. Yeah, this all looks right. Here, let's undo the deck. That's the easiest way to tell. If it's double, dual coil, then... Yeah, it's the regular dual coil. Seems it's just the box with the goodies that says Engine Nano on here. They must have given me the wrong add-ons. Uh, the regular box just says Engine. It doesn't talk about the Nano. I don't see any signs that this is a Nano or anything like that. Yeah, this is the correct tank. It, standard kit includes... Yeah, 
everything checks out, but what the fuck? They just gave me the wrong accessories. Now let's go ahead and put some of this stuff away. This fucking pisses me off, though. This is bullshit. This is absolutely bullshit. How the hell do you send someone the wrong goddamn accessories in the official box? I'm using this little thing here to hold this up. This is the deck. It's just standard velocity, nothing special. Now, I'd like to show you a little trick. If you use a screwdriver to get this glass off, it's near impossible to do it alone without uh, some sort of tool assistance. You take a screwdriver, or anything pointy really, just slide it in there, into that hole the way you're seeing it, and you hold it like this, you can easily get all the torque you need to remove the glass tank piece so that you can go and clean it. it this piece doesn't come off, so... It just turns, but it doesn't unscrew. And you can also take the glass out of this metal cage piece and really get a good cleaning if you need it. And the last piece that comes out is a drip tip, which initially is extremely tight and difficult. Depends how, like even with long nails, it's not going to just come out so easy. But uh, after you juiced it up ever so slightly, it'll go in and out without issues, so easy enough. The rest is all just rotating parts, but they're otherwise built in one solid piece, so to speak. I'm going to go wash all this stuff and come back after that. We'll continue. So, everything's washed. Now, when you're putting this together, you got to make sure that the silicone gaskets match up correctly in the correct orientations uh, otherwise you may have a bad time so in this case that side goes there the gasket for the other part is in there right now sometimes it may stick to the glass uh, you just make sure there's one gasket on each side before you reassemble the whole thing otherwise you might be scratching your head later why the hell is this not working correctly so let's go ahead and build. I'm using Temco's 26 gauge stainless steel. This is the 316L. Now the critical part is understanding the correct build for your device. I'm going to use standard drill bits here. Like how do we? This is how I determine how to use the correct diameter for this particular device. I stuck this in the wick hole it's still a little bit loose so let's move one drill bit size up here and do the same test this is the 5 and 30 second bit that goes in there nice and smooth so this one fits inside that hole and going one higher up here it is now too big two options here you can either use the smaller one that does fit, or the bigger one, and I'm going to use the one that just fit inside the hole without going over. When I take the bit and hold it where I'm going to be putting my coils, it looks like there'll be enough clearance from the edge to the chamber, so we're good. Now the coil itself, my point, is going to be actually reliant on this gap between these two posts. I actually utilize more of the inner of the chamber as, so it doesn't make contact towards that outer perimeter and make a short against the chamber. Now I'm going to make a coil here and I do them with drill. I stick the chuck in the drill or the bit rather and catch my lead in there and then I can pull on it and twist it. I'm going to do this off camera because it's just you're not going to be able to see anything but it allows me to get even pressure pulling on it when I'm wrapping it to do it with with the drill. So a little fast forwarding magic. I 
took this and after wrapping it, I pulled it out a little bit, squished it back in just to provide a little bit of spacing. I use spaced coils with my stainless steel. It doesn't have to be a lot. Now when I take it off the drill, this is what we are left with at the moment. Just It's spaced. Uh, you do want a little bit of spacing if you're going to do temperature control. Hopefully you guys can see this with the piece of paper. I count the number of rings or reps from the inside where the leads are. So I like to count eight in my case. It's just enough to fit. Uh, wouldn't be able to go any higher than that, but it is with minimal spacing able to fit completely within the spacing between the two posts there. So now when I slide these leads into their respective holes, I will actually push with my thumb up against it all the way, all the way against the post. No gaps whatsoever, no eyeballing anything. It's just going to easily and reproducibly sit up against the post with that drill bit. And if I find the little hex tool they gave us, Push that up here again and tighten one side down. And I'm starting with the right side because the drill bit is um, just aligned that way. And then I flip it around so I can easily screw the other side in here. And again, just like before, I will actually press it all the way up against this post and tighten her down. So we're not trying to eyeball anything. We're just using the post itself as the reference. Tighten it down reasonably good. And actually, I think I could push that in a little further. I didn't quite. I had it on an angle there. There we go. That looks about right. So not a whole lot of adjusting as far as height and angle needs to be changed. The big thing here, let's see if you can see with this piece of paper, is there is actually no gap if you look at it from the side. And if anything, it kind of cuts in a little bit. And that's the key to my method of this coiling is there is no gap here. It relies on being closer to the center of the deck. The spacing has to be scrunched in just enough so that it doesn't contact, uh, you know, doesn't make any contact against the posts. And it's not that hard. So I'm going to stick the drill back in and go ahead and line it up correctly here so that it's level to start off with. So now all I'm going to be doing is with the tiny screwdriver, ignoring the outer wrap on each side, I'll be pushing them in, scrunching like this. So those eight that we counted are the ones we're essentially manipulating. And we're just pushing them in a little bit, like so, so that they don't make uh, contact with the post. It'll leave a small gap there. And we just fine tweak it a little bit, just a couple of nudges. And we're completely ignoring the outside wrap. I can also adjust the height if it looks a little slanted. Now, as after I cut my leads, I'm going to show you an extra trick I like to use. If I can do this in, on, in the camera anyways. We do our normal cut. Try not to shoot it into your eye. Now, we still have those little super tiny lead bits poking out ever so slightly, and I have a little trick I like to use to completely get rid of those. And if I can find my regular old tweezers, 
and you'll see what I'm talking about here in just one second. Now, if I can get a good angle to show you, there's, hopefully you can see that lead poking out just a little bit where we cut it. If we grip it with our tweezers and just sort of pinch it and make sure you catch it, and then you're basically going to squeeze and turn. And that will flatten it out and nothing's poking out anymore completely smooth. So this is what it looks like with the drill bit using a flashlight. You should be able to see that there's a triangular gap in between where the leads come into the very first wrap. You can see that that's my intention. So it's kind of like an inner coil of eight wraps and then the outer ones that are acting as the leads that I basically ignore completely. So off camera, I installed the other coil after I built it. Hopefully you can see this a little better. This is roughly what the end product looks like readjusted. They do go into the middle quite a bit. If I can get a good angle here sideways, you can see it almost from the side looks as if those openings are entering the posts themselves. Like you can't even see the complete inner edge diameter on one side of each of those coils and by having it this way it ensures that the coil it does not stick out far enough to touch the outer chamber wall when we put the chimney back on and we utilize that extra little bit of space in between the posts. So let's get this on a mod and we'll do a little dry firing. I always do this first. Even on a fresh set of coils, I'm just going to use 60 watts. That should be fine. And pulse them lightly. And everything looks pretty good here. Smooth, even. No issues. If I can show you. And let's go ahead and wick this. So here we got my rayon. The device is turned off and already cooled down thanks to movie magic. And I'm going to, from this string, peel off about this much. This is a learning process. And then you just peel it all the way down. How much? You're going to have to experiment with yourself a little bit. And then after I do that, I use the other end. And I thin it out slightly with my fingernail. Let's move this out of the way and just thin it out a little bit so I can twist it a little easier and let it taper in there without issue. And just make a point. And then you would thread it through and be gentle. Now, this is a bit loose, but it'll thicken up in my case because it's a little thicker. And you can actually feel the squeak, and you can see the coils moving slightly, but it's not warping. That's perfect. So I'm going to give these a cut on one side here. I can get these scissors in right outside the edge a little bit. Actually, let's give it even more space just so I can show you guys. And we'll be repeating this whole process again, thinning a little bit, twisting. And thread it through. And just lightly work it in. If it's the right density, you can see that it just moves the coil spacing, but it doesn't warp them. That's, that's what I want. Now I'm going to try, if I can, to cut these roughly evenly here towards the outside of the atomizer a little bit longer than you may normally have expected or see others try and teach you. 
we are using rayon and I do want these to hit all the way to the bottom of the floor after we put them through the wick holes and the way we're going to be cutting these they need to be sufficiently long it'll make sense hopefully that gives a decent view of what it looks like in the coil and now it's time to work this up we are going to take our shears here if I can get the camera angle right I'm going to basically be trying to fan these out and really difficult to do on a strange angle like this but the idea is just to move it back and forth slightly trying to get the other one out of the way so I can show you the fanning is going to flatten it out so to speak and the reason for it is that we can cut it on an angle but I'm trying to get the other guy out of the way here first. So it's kind of just flattening it sideways like that so that we have a slightly better angle to approximate. And we're going to be cutting them on an angle this way, if that makes sense. I'm just going to make sure that's perfect. And carefully work these scissor points in here. Be careful not to snip a lead, by the way. And we are going to essentially make this diagonal cut right about there. So we're cutting on an angle and removing this huge mass underneath. And let's do a little cleaning, tidying up here. Off camera, I finished the other leads. You can see they all look like they're bent upwards. Although, as you guys know now, the cut itself on the angle makes them look that way because of the fanning out. And I'm going to show you at least one here on how we're going to poke this in. And part of the reason we needed that extra length is because it's thicker on the inner lower section so this thing's going to be curving in from the outside so to speak and there's no specific trick you're just going to poke it in with your screwdriver and just take it slowly I'm just making sure it all sits in there neatly, nicely, and straight, and that it's touching all the way to the very bottom. I don't know how well you can see it, but we do want this stuff to go all the way down and touching the very base. Finish the other side off screen. Now, I threaded it from right to left when I was putting the wick in because the right side here has the lead on the top. So, this is where I want a thicker portion. And whichever side it's going in from is going to have the thicker foot or shoulder. And if I stick my screwdriver here and just stick it in a little bit and push up slightly. It will help ensure that the coil is making contact with that side. We don't have to worry about the left side because the coil is on the bottom. So we only have to worry about the right side. And that's why the left side is the thinner side. So make sure you thread from the direction with the lead that's going up if you want to maximize this. Because the side that has more material to it will be the best candidate for having access to just push up slightly. The other one's off camera here. Fast forwarding. And just to give you a better look at what we're 
and resulting in. We're just going to take a little bit of juice and prime this up. And I do it by applying a few drops here. I'm just trying to hide the Vapor DNA logo because I just happen to be using one of their bottles. The, the juice I put a couple drops on from the shoulder side on one end and then on the other here. And I don't do a lot. Just sort of enough for it to saturate a little bit and just work each side a little bit more. I don't want a sopping, sloppy mess because I don't think it's necessary. So yeah, I'm going to put a little bit extra right around here since this is all dry. And repeat on this side. Just, it's a little bit moist here. There's juice on the inside of the coil at this point, even though we didn't do anything. But that's it. So let's go ahead and screw this back on. And I haven't even bothered to fire this thing. It's not quite juicy enough where I would. And if I can get this threading to line up. There we go. Essentially, the rest of the saturation is going to come from the tank itself. As opposed to the priming. Priming is just a starter. And I'm blocking off the top with my finger. And that helps prevent any flooding in the in the chamber. And I don't even think I'm going to fill this thing the whole way up. But just enough for now. Close that. Release our finger off the top. And that's it. Now, when I first do this, I will also touch the O-rings with the tip of the bottle, just a little bit for the lubricating effect, and that'll take care of all the tightness on the drip tip. It just goes in super easy, it, it's lubricated, and no more troubles. Now I'm just going to let this sit for a little while, and... After a few minutes, it should be good to go. Alright, so, I'm back up top. Pretty much all the close-ups was being done on top of this box with the same camera. I had to adjust a whole bunch of different settings and mess with lighting and things, and it probably didn't turn out well. But, we built... We built the device, the atomizer, and we wicked it. And we filled it up. We partially primed it lightly and then filled it up a little bit. I didn't even bother filling it all the way. And I have my Rouleau uh, Gen 3. And before I even screw this on, like the normal way for me is to, when I filled it for the first time after wicking, partial prime, fill it up however much I want to fill it up. And then I just let it sit for. A few minutes. Let it do its thing. It, it'll be fine. Probably. So I want to get a little bit in on the, the mod end of things. Specifically, these Wisemax, what I do. So I'm going to switch over to desktop view now. Now, I think I may or may not have already mentioned it. If not, I'm mentioning it again. One of two types of people, like one of two types of mods you'd want to buy, typically. You're either A, going to go expensive, or B, go cheap. That's the nutshell. When you buy expensive, you're going to get something like, let's say, a DNA, or uh, actually, they even mention it here, like DNA, Yee devices, etc. You're going to be paying a pretty penny, but you're going to be paying for quality. Not all of us are going to necessarily want to make that choice, and for the other end of things is the cheap end, which is China products. Now, in my case, everything is about what's called Arctic Fox. I have no problem buying a cheap. I paid 40 bucks 
for this. I paid 20-ish for this atomizer. I think when I bought it last year, it was maybe $30. So still pretty cheap. So 40, 40, 50 bucks. Yeah, that's a reasonable price for a mod if it works, right? There's only one direction of cheap I go at this point, and it's all because of this Arctic Fox firmware. So the only mods I would consider would be on their compatibility list. And that's uh, various Joytech, Wise Mac, e Leaf, and Cobra Ending. And it's basically a mod uh, by a group of, I believe, a team in Russia. And it's based on like the MyEvic type stuff. And it's sort of some reversed engineered stuff. But it gives you similar functionality and comfort as the DNA devices and such. Anything that's not on these lists, like a smock brand or whatnot, I'm not even going to bother. Like, if I'm going to get anything that's not compatible with this, it better be like a DNA or something. Because there's no going back. Once you've seen and experienced it, you'll know what I mean. So, we have... And this is exactly what I did when this came in. When this came in, I pulled it out of the box. I took the batteries out of my old one. They both use the three, three 18650s. I have six of them, and I keep them in a married rotation back and forth. I put the batteries in. I turned the device on. I'm not trying to flick you guys off, but I turned the device on, and I plugged it into the USB that's going into my computer. Before I did that, I actually downloaded it. If you go to nfeteam.org, you'll get this web page that you're seeing here in front of me right now. You go here, download NFE tools, download whatever the latest one is. You always want to keep up the latest one when you're installing a new uh, image. So you download the NFE tools, and then you go back, you download Arctic Fox. So you grab the latest image of that. And I already am running on these. Extract wherever. Uh, this is what it looks like. The NFE toolbox. And the, the firmware itself is a .bin file. I just threw it in the same folder. Whatever. And double click. And toolbox.exe. Hit firmware update update from file you should I think see your device listed right off the bat and find that bin file you downloaded and flash it I don't need to do that since we already did it takes a moment and when it's done you can hit cancel and now you have I think it reboots the device and so on once that's done right off the bat go into as you just saw here Arctic Fox Configuration, Advanced, and right here where it says USB Charging, turn it off. It may be on by default. Turn it off, and then hit Upload Settings to turn off any charging it would initiate when it goes into that, because you don't want to charge through USB. When that's done... I don't know if you need to re-plug in the device or not, but once the USB charging is disabled, you can just keep it plugged in and play around as you see fit. And it's this tool that makes this software so awesome because you can do a lot of things like uh, add a battery voltage offset if it's reading the batteries too low from what they actually are you can give it a slight offset so the percentages are a little more accurate and all sorts of other odds and ends the only one i specifically recommend is usb charging disable it so that when you plug it in it doesn't try and charge it and 
for the moment that's all show on that. We have our atomizer here, right? So I turned off the device. I have a habit of turning it off when I screw the atomizer on. And then turning it on. Right now it's not plugged in, or it's not even on. So I'm going to turn it on. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, and it's on. And this is the other feature you get. The size of the firmware and the configuration, you can actually monitor in real time the device. And I haven't fired that coil yet. We primed it, we filled the tank, that was it. Cold resistance here is going to be accurate because it hasn't been fired yet. It's basically at room temperature. And you'll always see fluctuations in the live resistance. It's going to, if you fire a stainless steel coil, the, the resistance will change and stay changed for a while. If you mess with temperature control, that matters. If you're just going with firing it at power mode with wattage, it doesn't matter. In my case, I just want to make sure, and I can see it's reading at 0.383. And I am going to use that information. It's basically the same coil I had in the other in the other guy. And you can also see your battery voltage. You can see what it's doing, the numbers, if you fire the device and vape at the same time. I have the cable running in a weird spot at the moment, so it's I can't really show that. And so here we go. Inside the configuration, I already have a profile for the temperature control and a profile I use for wattage. And you can basically set all this stuff up on the device itself as well. But it's really nice being able to do it on your computer because you can A, download the settings. If I download it, whatever settings I put on the device, gets loaded up here. If I upload any changes I made here would go to the device or if I changed in something I didn't mean to and I I could just download and it'll just pull it back and it's like it never happened. And I like adjusting all these variables on a computer screen. You can also save as and stuff so you can make copies of your settings. So the only weird thing and I just can't find the ultimate reasoning for it is my stainless steel 316L coils that I make with the Temco wire are very anemic in temperature control. Otherwise, they're fine. And the only solution I've really had that I liked was using not the TFR values, but TCR, and not at the normal 88 or 92 values that you would be told, but I use 130, and it was the same 130 I used on this guy. Uh, lower is still fine, like 120 or something, but you have to mess around with that a little bit, potentially. If you have it at 400, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm using Fahrenheit, and it's just not doing crap, chances are you just need to set an appropriate temperature coefficient. Uh, it, I, that's all I know. <laughs> that, as far as that goes. And by doing that, I can lock my resistance here at the exact resistance that the device is reading. And this is where things get interesting. As you can see, my last coil was 0.382. This coil is reading 0.38. Three. So I'll just go ahead and make that updated change, and this will lock it in so that I don't have to mess with it. I don't use the smart feature. There's a smart mode that if you're using different atomizers with different resistances and stuff, it'll let you screw it on and blah, 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 blah. It'll automatically go to the right profiles and things like that. I don't bother with it. I'm a one-device guy. If I like it, that's all I want until something better comes along. And it, within the temperature control, like if 
you don't care about temperature control, temperature control, you would just use power. Power mode. Set a power, your wattage, adjust it up and down as necessary. This coil, I would typically be vaping at around maybe 110, 110 watts or so. But I've kind of gone back to messing with power, power, uh, sorry, temperature control mode. So for temperature control mode, I also use the PI regulator. It's like a PID PID, but it only, it doesn't use the derivative value, just the P in the I's. It defaults to 1850 for the P value. I recommend turning that down if you're not using some really crazy coil. If it's a little too aggressive, you just want to drop that P value down to, say, 300 up to maybe 800. And just leave the default I value and adjust the P up and down if you think you want it. The actual power you set here is going to be irrelevant. Unless you have a preheater, I forget how that word worked exactly. I think it had something to do with the range, where it, if it says zero by default, as by default, it will just kick, kick in the PI regulator right off the bat. So this is relevant. It's just the calculus stuff kicks in immediately, and it it controls all that for you. The uh, where was it under for screen? This is one one thing I like to change. Uh, under screen where it says layout, and this is like their newer thing. I it used to be like a classic or whatever. I like to have for temperature control mode the last power value because then I can, after I vape, I can take a look at the device and see the actual uh, wattage that it last hit at. It gives me some idea at, at what powers it's hitting at different temperatures. Everything else is basically you just get to play around with it. There's a lot of different things to play with, and not all of it's very well documented. So, yeah, I don't mess with power curves and preheats and all that crap. It just, no. It's either wattage or power uh, temperature control. That's it. As far as I'm concerned, anyways. Everyone's going to be a little different, but... So, let's go ahead and unplug this guy and see how it performs. I'm back in full screen. Now, the last coil I was vaping at about 485 degrees F. I'm going to, since I haven't even fired this once yet, fresh build, fresh wick, fresh everything, I'm going to just bump it down for a moment to say 410 F. And these numbers are only relative to the device. It doesn't mean 410F as in what another device will be claiming as well. So, it's accurate only within this exact device. If I tell it, you know, 500, it'll hit 500 as I mess around with different things. But if I put it on a different temperature control device, 500 may be something completely different. It'll still be accurate relative to that device, but it will not go across the board. So there's a lot of weird things. But uh, let's try it out for the first time. And I start a little low so that it can break in just a little bit, or in case it didn't prime very well, it won't hit too hard. And I can see, I don't know if you guys can, but right there, some, no, you can't see that very well. The upper one here, if I zoom out maybe more, because I'm not auto-focusing and I'm not going to bother adjusting it, it tells me its last wattage was 84.8. So I already know that's a little bit on the low end. So I'm going to bump it up a little bit. Let's say 426. And it's still a little bit uh, weak. 
that one only showed 78.4. I think it took us, um, I wasn't inhaling as hard, so it wasn't cooling the coil, and so it was using a little bit less power. It's a nice little feature to tell how your coil performs based on your exact circumstances per drag, which is awesome because if I go back to wattage mode, I have a good idea of where its where its sweet spot ranges are. You don't have to use the temperature control. Alright, we're going to bump this up now. 450. Now it's showing 112.3 watts. And that's that's hitting about right. Now normally with these wicks, we with rayon specifically, when we had those tails fluffed out, we cut into it and, or, well, th that was the way I used to do it, was I cut into it partway and then trimmed the top and then I'd have the lower half go into the wick hole. And then you have this little nub that sticks out. This newer method I'm using, I flip-flop that right. So there is no nub sticking out. Instead, the that thickest part is kind of on the underside of the shoulder instead of sticking out. And I'm liking the results. Only catches that feels that method has a little bit more of a break in time. The other way, it's pretty much first hit is good. Unless you messed up the density or something along those lines, perhaps. This one, it takes a little bit of before it really um, reaches its true flavor, sweet spot, potential. But yeah, it's performing quite nicely. So, to wrap this up, if you were directed to this video by me, then you probably asked me either about my setup or my recommendations. If what you saw you liked, this is what I recommend. If you did not like what you saw, if any of it went over your head or looks outside of the scope of your interests or abilities or time or anything, I'm not the right person to ask. So, hopefully, that was worth something to you. I am Necrosis. Let's have a beep. And remember, I'm Necrosis.